Hello, I'm Terry McCann. I work with companies and service organizations to improve quality and compliance management to be leaner, more efficient, and above all, as effective as possible. This presentation for management and staff of long-term care homes in Ontario offers a proposal for discussion. The background is discussions that I have had with administrators who have concern over the potential for non-compliance which could lead to critical incidents and complaints. This proposal is not presented as a solution but as a platform for discussion. The idea is to seek together for a solution to the challenge of reducing the risk of avoidable critical incidents and resident complaints in a long-term care home especially those flowing from non-compliance with the Long-Term Care Homes Act and regulations. These events frequently trigger inspections from the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. The proposed strategy is the well-known PDSA, Plan Do Study Act, sometimes called Plan Do Check Act, which is recommended by quality organizations such as ISO, the International Organization for Standards, and ASQ, the American Society for Quality, and is endorsed and recommended by Health Quality Ontario and others. The underlying principles and assumptions for this proposed action plan are to take a risk-based approach in dealing with potential findings of non-compliance to the Long-Term Care Homes Act and regulations. First, non-compliance that could result in harm to residents then non-compliance that would likely result in high dissatisfaction on the part of residents. Finally, non-compliance that could result in orders from the inspector due to repeated infractions. Firstly, compose the Compliance and Quality Task Team. I suggest the Administrator slash Executive Director, the Director of Care, and the Director or Coordinator for Continuous Quality Improvement are all essential for the success of the initiative. Probably also the Director of Resident Services. There are probably a few others whose role or expertise would make them valuable contributors to the team. On the other hand, you do not want the team to be too large or its focus will get fuzzy and it will take longer to come to consensus. Secondly, identify any potential critical incidents which should be avoidable, but with high risk of occurrence, or if they occurred, could have severe impact on health and safety. Thirdly, identify sources of potential resident complaints which may be easily detectable or have high risk of occurrence. Informal conversations with the Residence Committee or Family Committee may be helpful here, as well as strengthen the relationship with the committees. Fourthly, using a retrospective review, identify repeat compliance findings from the last two or three years, which, if they recurred yet again, would be embarrassing to say the least. Assess risk of recurrence noting those with high risk or where there is questionable internal control. 5. Assess whether the latest Quality Improvement Plan QIP, has all these potential events in items 2 to 4 covered and note any gaps. Up to this point no tools are used for steps 2 to 5. Reliance for identification is upon domain and tribal knowledge. However, if nothing obvious suggests itself, consider using ministry inspection protocols to help create focus and trigger recognition. Some appropriate examples would be medication, reporting and complaints, safe and secure home, abuse, neglect and retaliation, falls prevention, pain, responsive behaviors, skin and wound care, critical incident response. You can surely suggest others that relate to resident safety concerns or high dissatisfaction. 6. Articulate steps 2 to 5 above in a statement of risk with a cost analysis 
comparing action versus no action for presentation to the board of directors obtain board approval and support for targeted action to address these risks with a clear plan that is ancillary to the current QIP with a view to incorporation into the next revision of the QIP. Step 6 requires some knowledge of cost-benefit analysis with estimates being very approximate and based on domain knowledge. Step 6 is to address the fact that there may be costs which have not been budgeted regardless of whether the decision be action or no action. To choose no action now almost certainly means some degree of unknown action in the future, such as time needed for complaint or critical incident inspections and follow-up activities, all unplanned. It is imperative that the board give not only its approval, but no less importantly its public support. This is prerequisite for rolling out the rest of the Compliance and Quality Initiative, particularly as this pertains to fostering a culture of quality improvement, as will be seen in subsequent steps. Board approval and support is a go-no-go no go decision. It may be wise to gain the support of key board members before presentation to the full board of directors. Time for a quick interlude to clarify some terms that are often confused. Correction. An action taken to address a particular instance of non-compliance. For example, resident number one was not being assisted by two personal support workers for certain activities as directed in the plan of care, but is now being correctly assisted because the personal support workers have been informed. Corrective action, an action taken to prevent recurrence of a non-compliance. For example, the required assistance stipulated on resident number one's plan of care following a fall had not been transcribed to the cardex for resident number one, resulting in the incorrect assistance being given. The cardex has now been updated, which should prevent the non-compliance recurring. Preventive action, an action taken to prevent occurrence of a non-compliance. For example, the policy or procedure for updating the plan of care now adds a review and approval step to ensure that the CARDEC system has been updated prior to approval of new plan of care changes. Mitigation, also called a control an action or measure which will reduce the severity or seriousness of an adverse event or render it unlikely to occur. A couple of examples. A resident rolling onto a cushioned floor from a bed that has been lowered almost to floor level should not suffer the same seriousness of injury as from falling out of a normally raised bed onto a hard floor. Locked doors requiring electronic security passes reduce risk of residents with dementia from wandering. Assuming board approval and support, we now move to phase two, the do phase, where we commence a pilot implementation of carefully chosen preventive actions. Step seven, looking back to step two, namely identify any potential avoidable critical incidents, Perform a prospective root cause analysis, for example, five whys, for each potential critical incident identified in step two. This should include a review of root causes from previous similar events, asking the question, why might this still be at high risk of recurrence? Eight, for each root cause at unacceptable risk of recurrence, perform failure modes and effects analysis, FMEA or FEMEA, and propose appropriate mitigations beyond what is already in place if resident or staff safety is in question. FEMEA identifies what could go wrong in a certain context, the likelihood, what adverse effects could follow, and their severity and likelihood. After controls have been proposed, a new assessment is made. FEMEA is usually done only when there could be risk of harm to residents or staff. 9. 
review the effectiveness of the existing mitigations and controls and propose improvements where appropriate. 10. Now looking back to step 3, identify potential likely complaints, perform a prospective root cause analysis, for example five ones, for each potential complaint identified in step 3. This should include a review of root causes from previous similar events, asking the question, why is this still at high risk of recurrence? Assuming resident and staff safety are not at risk for complaints, FEMIA is not required. Propose preventive action for each root cause. 11. Looking back to step 4, retrospective review of inspection reports for repeat findings, perform a prospective root cause analysis for each finding at high risk of recurrence identified in step 4. This should include a review of root causes from previous similar events asking the question, why is this still at high risk of recurrence? Wherever resident or staff safety are at risk, FEMIA should be performed as in Step 8. Propose appropriate mitigations or preventive actions beyond what is already in place. The last step in the due phase is Step 12. Review all proposed mitigations and preventive actions. Look for so-called quick wins, such as where multiple potential adverse events share the same root causes, or a family of root causes can be addressed with the same set of preventive actions. Address these first with pilot implementations, then proceed with the easier solutions to implement and save the most difficult to implement till last. From common experience, it is quite likely that root cause analysis will show that two of the intermediate causes of serious issues or events are one, an organization culture not fully supportive of continuous quality improvement, and two, bad or inadequate documentation practices or policies. There is value for any organization to review both of these periodically as prerequisite underpinnings for compliance, quality and continuous quality improvement. During this initiative, these should be reviewed in parallel with steps 7 to 11 in the due phase. Results of the review should be brought into step 12. Let's take a few minutes to look a little deeper at both organization culture and good documentation practice regardless of whether our documentation is electronic or paper. We call them general causes because they can be detected as common causes across most disciplines and departments of an organization. We call them interim causes because they are not root causes strictly speaking. One can always go further by asking the question why. All successful organizations have a vision, mission and goals that are pursued according to certain principles which are subscribed to as values within the organization. However, not every organization with a declared vision, mission, goals and set of values is successful. Compare Toyota on the one hand and the investment banker Goldman Sachs who was a major player in the 2007 subprime mortgage crisis. The difference very often is between the formal espoused value principles and the informal principles which form the basis of what actually happens in the organization. What actually happens, the way we do things, is what constitutes the culture of the organization. For example, the Goldman Sachs business website states, integrity and honesty are at the heart of our business. Jane or Joe Public can be excused for reading this with a degree of cynicism, given the actual cultural history of that organization. It is important then to establish where there may be significant gaps between the desired organizational behaviors that would support the espoused principles on the one hand, and actual behaviors suggesting a different set of beliefs on the other. 
There are tools and instruments available to do this, such as the OAT, or Organizational Assessment Tool, or Organizational Assessment Instrument, as some call it. The leadership team should approach any significant gaps found as if they were complaints, thus do a root cause analysis and propose mitigating or preventive actions, then resume from step 12 above. The principles behind documentation control are the same no matter whether documentation is paper or kept in electronic format. Identify and store documents and records required for compliance separately from other documentation. Records required to establish or demonstrate compliance to the Act and regulations, whether electronic or hard copy, are controlled with one or more documented quality management procedures. Documented quality management procedures themselves and any other documentation required for sustained compliance are also controlled with one or more documented quality management procedures. Documented controls ensure that quality management documents are approved for use by the appropriate level of responsibility and reviewed for adequacy by one or more subject matter experts prior to approval. Such controls will be applied both on initial publication and subsequent revisions. How records are controlled will be specified in the various documented processes and procedures which call for and describe the production and maintenance of various records. For example, the procedure to be followed for transcribing relevant portions of the plan of care to a medium to be used by personal support workers who may not have point of care access to a resident's plan of care, such as CARDEX. The latest current versions of documented quality management procedures are not to be inaccessible to the relevant staff locked away in a cupboard or drawer, but copies are available at point of use, whether electronic or hard copy. Ideally, training records show that staff are aware of where they can find the latest revision of any procedure, process or protocol that they are required to follow. Finally, controls prevent the unintended use of obsolete documents and ensure legibility is maintained for both documents and records. Phase 3 is the study phase where we measure and monitor. The study phase overlaps phase 2 and begins immediately after the first of the pilot mitigations or preventive actions is implemented. Each preventive action plan should include determining a method for measuring effectiveness and impact after implementation and reporting the results for monitoring to top management, the quality team and the entire organization. Phase 4 is the ACT phase, where we refine, make adjustments and permanently implement one by one the pilot implementations of earlier phases. For each pilot implementation, determine where actions need to be taken to minimize negative impact and improve effectiveness and efficiency. Apply the changes in a controlled fashion. Once a critical mass of improvements has been implemented, cycle back to phase one in a new initiative with new risk-based prioritization until there is no further cost-benefit justification. Consider incorporating the above PDSA cycle into the next revision of the Quality Improvement Plan. Remember, this proposal is not presented as a solution, but as a platform for discussion, as we seek together for a solution. I'm Terry McCann. My company is TCMC Quality Management Services. Have a look at my website. My email address is terry.mccann at tcmc-qms.ca. If you have questions or comments, I would love to hear from you.